All right, well, uh, welcome to the Center for Digital Transformation of Health's uh, seminar series. And I want to start by uh, acknowledging the lands on which we are all living and pay respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. It's our great pleasure to have as our speaker today, uh, Dr. Peter Haug. And I think the, the roots for this uh, seminar go back to the spring of 1994, when I was studying plasma physics at the University of Wisconsin and decided I did not want to do this for my life. And uh, so I went to visit at the University of Utah to look at the medical informatics program. And because I was kind of interested in imaging and, and uh, there's this professor there named Peter Haug that had some papers with radiology in the title. I met with him and one of his students was a former electrical engineering student that was a year ahead of me, Mike Gunderson. And when I met with him, he said, oh, Brian, this, this isn't rocket science, but the linguistics is killing me. And I happened to be married to a linguist looking for a career. And so I put Wendy in touch with Peter and it all ran from there after I taught Wendy how to program in C in our bedroom, which was a bad decision, bad idea. So uh, Peter um, earned an, um, a medical degree from the University of Wisconsin and then went uh, west to Utah uh, to continue his training. And while in Utah, he uh, fell under the spell of Homer Warner and others, or maybe it was falling under the spell of the mountains, or maybe it was falling under the spell of a certain nurse, but he ended up staying in uh, Utah and uh, leaving the practice of medicine to do uh, medical informatics and had a very successful and influential career there. And he's worked, I think, uh, primarily in uh, how do you do decision support and a lot with uh, Bayesian methodologies. And the way the linguistics uh, came into it is if you want to make decisions in medicine, you somehow have to understand all that text that's been written. And um, so that, I think, uh, dragged Peter into to natural language processing. And but again, I think and Peter, correct me when it's if I'm wrong. This is it, it wasn't NLP for its own sake. It was NLP to help uh, clinicians and others make better decisions at the point of care. So um, he, most recently, he um, served as the director of the Homer Warner uh, Research Center at Intermountain Health and is a semi-retired now a uh, professor at the University of Utah. So uh, Peter, looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us today. Wonderful, well, thank you, Brian. Can, uh, can everybody hear me fairly well? Okay, good, uh, glad to hear that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and manage my Zoom so we have a slideshow to work from, and then I'll dive into uh, describing what I'd like to uh, talk to folks about today. So uh, let me see here. I'm just going to move things around just a touch. Uh, desktop one, desktop two. Um, share. Can anybody see a slideshow? Uh, I can see a web browser. You can see a web browser. Well, then we're in the wrong place. Let me try that again. Uh, new share, um, desktop two. Aha, here we go. Trying now. Yep. Okay, let me get this thing up and going. Okay, so uh, just jumping right in. Um, today I wanted to talk about basically cl clinical decision workflows. Uh, I, I use the term workflows because that's what I've been very interested in for the last several years. Uh, the idea is that once upon a time in the old days, uh, when I was young, we were, we were happy to have alerts that we could bring up to alert the physician to either do something or to not do something. But they were point in time enterprises and they basically uh, injected a small amount of knowledge into the overall process of delivering care uh, as, um, you, you know, at a single point in time. Uh, and what's happening now 
uh, at least in our lab, is we're playing with processes that run over time and that uh, start at the beginning of the care process when you're trying to make a diagnosis, pass through an evaluation stage, and land ultimately on the disposition and treatment of patients. And so uh, rather than dive right into the details of that, I'm going to start uh, by introducing a little bit of where I am, who I am, and uh, what the help system has been. Uh, and uh, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the historical approach uh, to medication prescribing, essentially by describing two applications we've had in various versions of uh, the native hospital information system, uh, our health system in Utah. Uh, and then I'm going to spend uh, probably about half the discussion working from the 1990s to 2022, describing the evolution of a process uh, that focused on how you treat pneumonia in the emergency department, and that allowed us to explore different ways of putting together uh, knowledge uh, and delivering the results to clinicians. So jumping in with the introductions, um, Basically, before I jump into the introductions, I should probably say that over more than 40 years, I've had a million collaborators, numerous contributions. I can't even list them all here, uh, and I won't even try because uh, there are dozens and dozens, uh, certainly hundreds, uh, and uh, many of them have been students. And I appreciate all the efforts that people have brought to me to make me smart enough to keep working in this field. So I'll express my gratitude before I'll try to explain uh, where I come from and uh, try to uh, share some ideas. Um, so basically, back to the introduction. Um, first of all, I, I've already been well introduced, and so I won't spend much time here. Um, I basically am currently a working part-time. Uh, I work with a group called the Advanced Decision Support Group, uh, and the Advanced Decision Support Group is focused on trying to figure out how to uh, support clinical care with new and better technologies, and there are quite a few new and better technologies that need exploring. Uh, and so uh, with that brief introduction, I'll then introduce the company that I have worked for for more than 40 years, which is Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, Intermountain Healthcare basically is a uh, healthcare enterprise with multiple clinics and hospitals and home care and other aspects uh, across the state of Utah. Uh, in the past, we've had just a few instances outside of Utah, uh, in Nevada and in Idaho. But Intermountain Healthcare recently has, has begun to uh, reach out uh, and find partners with whom they can merge. And it looks like within the next year or two, uh, Intermountain Health Care will encompass uh, not only Utah, but a chunk of Nevada and Colorado and uh, uh, with some facilities in some other states also. Uh, and part of the interest in some of the applications I'm going to talk about uh, comes from the open question of whether we can make these applications work in other places besides Utah. So just to give a sense of the size and shape of Intermountain Healthcare, here we have uh, a little bit of an old diagram, but it basically gives a sense of the distribution of healthcare facilities uh, in Utah. Uh, that, uh, that, income, that Intermountain Healthcare uh, provides. And, um, and some statistics, uh, pre-COVID statistics, because it's been somewhat hard to get all the statistics updated in a rational way during COVID, but some statistics about uh, some of the things that go on in Utah. In particular, I'll draw attention to the 24 hospitals uh, and they're associated with emergency departments because much of our discussion today will be about uh, how you uh, 
uh, how you implement an electronic pneumonia protocol in an emergency department setting. So that's basically where Intermountain Healthcare lives, uh, the state of Utah, but growing. Uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of history of uh, the electronic health records that have been functioning over the years in Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, and uh, we always refer when we talk, when we hit this part of the talk to the HELP system, which uh, is an acronym for Health Evaluation Through Logical Processing, and which was one of the initial healthcare systems, or initial electronic health uh, record systems uh, to be developed in the United States uh, back when computers were very new to the medical world. And the history of the department actually reaches back to 1964 when its founding director, whose picture you see here, Dr. Homer Warner, uh, basically began to be uh, interested enough in uh, learning more about computers uh, that he essentially founded uh, a department at the University of Utah, uh, and that department was focused on how you essentially use computers in medicine. Uh, the picture you see, obviously, is not a modern computer. In fact, it's an analog computer, and I rather doubt if many of you have seen an analog computer in your life. They're a little different than the digital computers we live with today. But uh, at any rate, the department was initially cited at the LDS Hospital, which is one of the Intermountain Healthcare Hospitals, and at that time was a tertiary care facility in Salt Lake City. Um, that computer was supplanted uh, in 1967 uh, by a bigger computer, although bigger is, uh, is always relative when you come to, when you get to the discussing computers. The computer you see in the background was very interesting because you could walk around behind it. You could look at the um, transistor, transistors and the whole computer, which filled up a number of rooms, had significantly less compute power than the cell phone in your pocket has today. Nonetheless, it was a wonderful tool for building one of the first electronic healthcare uh, systems on, and um, the originators, three of the main originators you see in this picture, the originators of the HELP system wanted badly to provide a tool that would support decision support in clinical settings, and that was the core goal of the HELP system when it was originated. Um, it, it, this HELP system ultimately expanded not only throughout LDS Hospital, but uh, in the following two decades, and on significantly more powerful hardware, it became the electronic health record for all of Intermountain Healthcare's hospitals. Uh, however, decision support remained the key focus uh, of efforts, and, uh, and much research was done to explore the best ways to use computers uh, at the bedside. Uh, there were other benefits of automation that uh, we uh, realized were of significant value as time went by, such as the development of a robust database allowing very interesting research to be done. Well, in the mid-1980s, uh, the, the help system basically had matured to have a rich database. Uh, it was delivering advanced prompts and alerts in clinical settings. Uh, and uh, again, the focus of the 1980s version of the system was to try and enhance the quality of care. In the 1990s, uh, there was a push to actually move out of the hospital settings and to develop an ap applications that would serve in outpatient settings, in the clinics that Intermountain Healthcare was uh, building and developing. Uh, and so a second version of HELP, actually based on a different uh, technology, on client-server technologies rather than mainframe technologies, 
was developed and it became the standard ambulatory EHR at Intermountain Healthcare. In the 21st century, something happened uh, in this country, and I suspect many of you are aware of it. Essentially, with uh, many of the legislative uh, movements uh, at, the, at the federal level um, and a variety of regulatory pressures, it began to be difficult uh, to maintain uh, a independent um, electronic health record uh, that was used in a small or a limited number of localities. And ultimately, uh, in, uh, in 2017, the health system was replaced by a commercial system supplied by Cerner Corporation. Uh, since that time, the informatics researchers at Intermountain Healthcare have focused on how in this new environment, you customize uh, the applications to help with local care delivery. Uh, but uh, one of the things we've learned is that there need to be even newer technologies brought to bear on this problem. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a moment. But what I'd like to do is move on from here to a brief discussion of clinical decision support, actually very limited to two applications uh, describing uh, decision support for medications. Uh, the two applications come from HELP and HELP2. Actually, the one from HELP2 is the first one I'll describe uh, because it was used in the outpatient setting uh, as a part of a medication ordering application to supply medication alerts, something you folks have probably uh, run across since it's probably the most common single uh, decision support tool that we find in active electronic health records. Um, it's common because it's been recognized uh, that it has value, uh, because it's encouraged by various agencies, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, it is, uh, there are a number of companies who have as a primary focus uh, describing the logic for things like drug-drug interactions. The result has been decision support applications that generate large volumes of alerts. Uh, and these alerts uh, are often credited for contributing to something called alert fatigue, uh, which is when uh, clinicians have received so many alerts, uh, many of which don't apply uh, to the clinical setting, that they basically choose uh, to try to turn off as many alerts as possible uh, and ignore those they can't turn off, which is not necessarily a good thing. The second application I'll talk about is actually a little bit older application, but embodies a prospective decision support uh, approach. It's called the antibiotic assistant. And we'll spend a little time talking about how that tool was used to intervene in care, uh, much mostly in ICU settings uh, for uh, sometimes difficult decisions about antibiotics. Um, well, just real quickly, many of you, you have many, you've probably seen many examples of a medication review application in which you can order a new prescription if you choose to, uh, such as ordering aspirin for this patient, which has a number of other um, medications ordered and some duplication also. Um, when you order an, a medication that is um, potentially contraindicated, these systems typically give a very simple response, something that looks like this, a drug interaction warning. Uh, in this case, a severe drug interaction warning saying that you shouldn't use salicylates with anticoagulants. Uh, this particular uh, alert is pretty standard and typical for drug-drug alerting. Uh, it's uh, it's um, brief and concise and with very little explanation. Many systems nowadays uh, have these alerts, but they implement along with the alerts the ability to do an info button. So that if you were to potentially click on that little eye there on the left-hand side of the screen, 
you would get a detailed explanation of why mixing anticoagulants of various sorts with salicylates is a bad idea. Uh, and uh, this kind of extended information has been found valuable in a number of instances. Uh, and so this is a pretty typical uh, application in most of the electronic health records you'll see. Uh, and it uh, represents a sort of um, retrospective uh, poke at the clinician. That is, it reacts after he's made his decision. Prospective, a prospective version might look something like this. This is a uh, example of the output of the antibiotic assistant and ordering program that ran on the original HELP-1 system. That system was interesting in that it had a um, character graphics mode. And so you didn't get uh, a very fancy display, but what you did get was dependent on the decision support system that lay behind it. Uh, and uh, could be very useful to somebody trying to sort out how to treat a patient. So in this particular example, what you see is you see that the top part of the screen summarizes the patient. It talks about uh, their diagnosis, uh, abscess drainage. It talks about uh, some of their rena some of their uh, uh, labs that might affect decision making about antibiotics. Uh, and other aspects of the patient's uh, current state. Uh, it also describes what antibiotics the patient is currently on, and it describes which, which bacteria have grown out of uh, that abscess drainage. And then what it adds to the mix is a therapeutic suggestion, in this case, to change the antibiotics to a different set of antibiotics that uh, it would be thought to be more beneficial to this patient. Now, this kind of prospective uh, intervention uh, is nice to the extent that um, it, uh, it allows the clinician to understand fairly readily what's going on, but it's also nice because it can use information that is not necessarily available to the clinician. Uh, that is information that's been collected over time as other patients have had uh, various infections, have had cultures taken, have had treatment with various antibiotics, uh, and have had antibiotic susceptibilities uh, determined for the bacteria that make up their infections. So to give you a sense of what might lie behind uh, a tool like this, uh, I'll show you a screen that describes the experience with uh, different abscesses uh, over five years and over six months, the last six months. Um, it tells which bacteria are typically found in those abscesses. And then it also tells which antibiotics uh, have the best ability to treat those organisms. And it has an interesting addition. It will tell you the cost of treatment for 24 hours. This results in an application that can uh, use its logic to uh, determine not only the best antibiotic to treat a patient with in terms of uh, bacterial susceptibilities, but also the best treatment um, in terms, of, in terms of cost to the patient. So this particular application uh, was, was used uh, heavily in the 1990s and was reported on by Dr. Scott Evans and, another, and a group of colleagues in the New England Journal in 1998. And it had uh, interesting results in that it basically uh, significantly uh, reduced the number of susceptibility mismatches, the number of drug alerts, uh, the number of dosage problems in the drugs that were given, um, and um, reduced excessive anti-infective uh, dosage of medications and other things also, and also resulted in a reduction in cost. 
Uh, and so uh, it, the fact that it was, first of all, prospective, and probably more importantly, the fact that it relied on knowledge that had been collected from uh, the data in the database over periods of time, uh, allowed it to make a real difference in the care of patients. So with those two simple introductions to how you might uh, take a look at supporting clinicians as they medicate patients, I'm going to move on to pneumonia. And again, the goal in pneumonia is obviously to provide similar results, to provide the right treatment for the patient. But it turns out that if you take a long look at pneumonia, um, what you really want to do is you want to get involved in the process of pneumonia care. So these other two applications were designed for a point in time. Uh, sometimes we call those stateless applications. Uh, they basically appear, consume the data that's available, make their decision, uh, share it with the clinician, and then disappear. But what would happen if you were building towards a process that included diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of a patient? Well, I'm going to talk for the next while about, about an application where we evolved over a period of two decades, more than two decades, an application that was able to do those things. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about where that application was going. So we're going to be focusing from here on in on pneumonia, on community acquired pneumonia basically, and its treatment in the emergency department. And I'm going to give you a history of a uh, series of interventions starting in the 1990s and ending in uh, well, not ended yet because we're actually laying out the applications for uh, next year's newer version, uh, but ending only when we solve the problem of how you create a process that helps to manage the care of pneumonia over a period of time. Uh, and uh, that kind of tooling uh, we think will be beneficial ultimately, not only for pneumonia, but uh, for a variety of other things. So I'm going to start by talking about paper-based guidelines used in the emergency department, how those paper-based guidelines were initially replaced by a uh, tool that, uh, that uh, was designed principally to detect pneumonia, then how we moved from detection to uh, a version of the application that managed the process of diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment, how we ported that application to our newer electronic healthcare system on Cerner, and then a little bit about where we're going with this application and where we think many applications of the kind should go in the future. So let me jump in. First of all, in actually between 1993 and 1997, although much of the data for evaluations was collected in 1996, 1997, um, uh, a paper-based guideline, guideline was used at the LBS hospital uh, in Salt Lake City uh, to help treat pneumonia, to help standardize the care of pneumonia and make it more consistent with the guidelines that were available in the literature. And so the idea was pretty simple. You start out by with the physician examining the patient and determining that the patient is eligible for the guideline. Then the physician goes to a filing cabinet, pulls out a paper-based guideline and starts filling out the data by taking a look on the, at the electronic medical record, finding information about things like the x-rays and the labs and other things, putting those into the guideline, basically uh, using a pen and pencil, and following the guidelines logic until they can deliver uh, the care that that particular patient needs, either sending the patient home with, the, with appropriate antibiotics to be taken orally, or putting the patient in the hospital where IV antibiotics and other interventions can be used to improve the, uh, to improve the outcomes for the patients. And uh, this intervention 
uh, actually when it was used, uh, did improve care, but we had a little problem with it. Uh, and uh, the problem basically was that it required uh, atypical work from the medical staff uh, and basically was used irregularly enough that it tended to fall out of favor uh, in those locations so that uh, the physician would say, hmm, the prevalence is so low that I, I seldom see pneumonia and, 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 and uh, so I don't worry too much about it. And besides which, I can't find that paper form uh, and in addition, I really am, am a well-trained doctor. I really don't need any guidance. Uh, and the whole process is too time-consuming. And therefore, essentially, this particular form of intervention uh, basically resulted in guideline-free care as physicians elected to go ahead and treat according to their experience uh, and essentially not not consult the guideline very frequently. So the question was, how do we do a computer intervention in this uh, scenario? Uh, and so uh, what we decided to do is we decided to let the computer start the process by doing the diagnosis. Uh, it could then automatically uh, trigger the guideline uh, and, uh, and that would, um, and that would start the ball rolling, and then it could give some form of simple advice to help the clinician decide at least whether the patient should be in an inpatient or an outpatient setting. And so to do this, we developed, in fact, uh, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my students developed a Bayesian network, which is a, a kind of a machine learning tool uh, that uh, was able to assign a probability for each patient in the emergency department uh, to the likelihood that they would, might have pneumonia. Uh, and so now the workflow was a little bit different. Uh, first of all, you have the diagnostic system, and as data flowed into the computer, uh, the diagnostic system would make up its mind whether the patient had a high enough probability of pneumonia to uh, go ahead and uh, encourage uh, treatment for that disease. Uh, if it decided the patient was eligible for the guideline, uh, it would then run a simple uh, pneumonia severity index, uh, basically that helped determine whether the patient had mild, moderate, severe pneumonia or severe pneumonia. And um, the results were then fed back to the clinicians who could make a decision about then about whether to send the patient home or put them in the hospital for their further treatment. This was implemented in the, uh, in the emergency room in LDS hospital uh, on those very old terminals that you see there. Uh, and uh, using the character graphics that we originally have in that environment. And the intervention in practice looked something like this. For those patients who had a high enough probability, uh, they basically received two pieces, of his, two pieces of information on the tracking board for patients in the emergency department. One was a pneumonia probability, and the other was a pneumonia severity index, a very simple index that went from one to five. Uh, patients who are one or two could generally be sent home. Patients that were four or five generally needed hospitalization, and patients who were three uh, were, were at level three. Um, basically, uh, the decision was left at the discretion of the physician. Um, this was a wonderful experiment, but uh, it uh, uncovered a fault in, our, in the data available in our electronic health records. Basically, the system needed chest x-ray results for a diagnosis. And so uh, we went looking for chest x-ray results and discovered that the reports were dictated and later transcribed when an x-ray was done in the ED. And report turnaround time, uh, the time to get the report into the 
uh, computer was 24 to 48 hours. That doesn't work in an emergency department where they're going to make a decision and, uh, and treat the patient in a much shorter time than that. Uh, in order to continue the experiment, what we did was we made use of an x-ray view station that was in the emergency department, and we asked the emergency physicians to interpret the chest x-rays and to enter the x-ray findings into a separate computer that uh, allowed us to uh, incorporate them into the diagnostic algorithm. So what you see in the picture here is a radiology viewing system and then the pneumonia diagnostic system sitting up above it. And the emergency department physician would interpret the x-ray himself and then put the findings into the uh, pneumonia system. Uh, this allowed us to test the applications, but it basically was unsustainable as a way to move forward with a clinical intervention. Uh, and so after appropriate testing, we basically uh, had to remove the pneumonia system and wait for some change in data availability. Fortunately, the change in data availability came to us as the radiology department adopted uh, speech recognition. Uh, they began to uh, install voice-to-text systems so that when the radiologist dictated the x-ray report, it was immediately converted to text and made available inside the electronic health record. Uh, this resulted in essentially near real-time radiology results in the, uh, in the EHR, uh, and the radiologists uh, recognizing that now their reports were going to participate in the care of the patients committed to, to providing service uh, for the emergency department x-rays on a 7 by 24 basis. So we actually had uh, x-ray data available in a timely fashion, and we could go back to trying to build the right model to deal with pneumonia. Here's a picture of a radiologist uh, using a older computer, uh, essentially <coughs> using speech recognition to input his report. Uh, the thing that was missing, however, was those reports were free text. And free text doesn't work very well when you're trying to trigger a decision support tool that uh, requires coded findings, basically. The good news is that we've been working in the area of natural language processing for a long time, and we had uh, and we're developing and continuing to develop pretty good tools uh, for coding the x-ray reports so that between the uh, speech recognition and the coding of the radiology reports, we basically had data appropriate for diagnosis in the, in the computer in usually, a, usually around 20 minutes. The result was we were able to build a second uh, computerized pneumonia application, which we called e-pneumonia, uh, and uh, we were able to build it in such a way that it could be dependent on our natural language processing services, <coughs> and it could then deliver the care that we wanted to deliver in a timely fashion without the emergency uh, department physicians having to uh, intervene by essentially inputting data. Uh, we chose to build this application on an independent application server, uh, and that allowed us to essentially treat some of these tools we've been talking about uh, as services. Uh, we basically were getting data from our legacy EHRs, the Help and Help, and Help Two systems, using their data services. Uh, we were getting messages uh, through a messaging service. Uh, we were able to send those to the emergency department tracking board. Uh, we had a probability services from a Bayesian network uh, execution tool uh, that we could configure as a service. And we, of course, had the natural language processing service. Uh, 
Uh, the core of this new application, because it was designed not only to diagnose, but also to evaluate and treat, was a process management application. Uh, and so when we create process management applications, we, we basically uh, create not a stateless kind of application, but a stateful application one that continues to function over a period of time, consuming new data steadily, interacting frequently with the users as frequently as necessary, and essentially an application that has a life uh, over, uh, um, over a time period appropriate for treating a patient uh, completely. Again, we rebuilt our diagnostic screening algorithm with a new Bayesian network, and we were able to use those NLP findings in this network. Uh, we built a new uh, tracking board for the ED uh, and used that tracking board to inform the physician when the probability of pneumonia was greater than 40%. Uh, we, when that happened, we put a little P in the protocol column, and by clicking on that P, you could go to an application that then led you through the process of evaluation of the patient's pneumonia uh, for severity and for the possibility of unusual organisms, and then disposition of the patient. Was the patient going to be an inpatient or an outpatient, or did they need to go to the ICU? Uh, and the treatments uh, in terms of which antibiotics the patient should be on. Uh, we basically uh, created an application to communicate with the physicians uh, and share the information with them, uh, and also to collect data from them if the data was not available in the EHR. Uh, and uh, so this particular screen is a screen from that application uh, that recommends hospital ward admission, and then it gives the reasons for that and asks for agreement or disagreement. Well, we were able to test this application in a small number of emergency departments uh, local to Salt Lake City, uh, and it uh, produced some interesting results. Uh, probably the most important result was that it reduced 30-day all-cause mortality in patients who came to the ED with pneumonia from about 7.8% to about 5.2%, which uh, we thought was a good reason to keep using it. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we basically uh, began to modify it and build it out. But the, a change in our EHR occurred at that point in time, and uh, that was the adoption that I mentioned earlier of the Cerner system. So on the Cerner EHR, the Cerner platform, uh, there were a group of tools that looked like they were going to be uh, good tools for implementing uh, the e-pneumonia protocol. And so we basically use these tools, the Cerner Care Pathways, their built-in decision support system, discern rules, uh, a, the native Cerner data access services, and uh, some additional services that we embedded, uh, notably the probability service, uh, we use those to rebuild this application, again, as a uh, stateful long-running application within the Cerner environment, uh, with the goal of testing it, not just in a small number of emergency departments, but across all of Intermountain Healthcare, all of their EDs. Uh, logic was added for drug-resistant organisms, and more recently, uh, for COVID pneumonia. And so that we, we did many of the same things that we've done in the earlier application. We put a little P in the tracking board uh, on the Cerner ED uh, application, and we built screens that allowed the application to uh, communicate with the user, uh, to uh, collect data, and to make, um, suggestions and recommendations about disposition and about treatment. In this particular case, 
as you see at the bottom of that screen, the application is recommending uh, ICU admission. Uh, and we were able to test this across, a ball in, across all of the EDs in Intermountain Healthcare, basically. Uh, and it, I won't read you this slide, but I will point out that it made a positive difference again in mortality and 30 day all cause mortality, but also in some other uh, important dimensions of care. For instance, when patients were supposed to, when patients fit the criteria for outpatient treatment, uh, it uh, did a better job than the native process in sending them to the outpatient setting. When the patients uh, were appropriate for inpatient care, it did a better job of putting them in the right inpatient location. And it did even modestly improve uh, the concordance with uh, antibiotic prescribing that uh, is recommended for patients with pneumonia. Whoops. Whoops. Uh, and, and, but there was one other result that was a practical result. It turned out that within Cerner, this application was somewhat difficult to maintain and to extend. And we began to wonder if there was another way we should be implementing this application. And that brings us to the present. We're in the middle of re-implementing this application as an interoperable clinical process. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about that uh, process because it reflects among other things, how the uh, world of computer technology and the world of uh, software um, and development standards has changed over the years. So a key feature of this new tool is that it uses the fire services from HL7, uh, which are services designed to uh, provide interoperable access to data and other aspects of healthcare. It uses these to provide data access, data storage, and ordering capability to the application. Um, uh, I, I, and it's expected to use these services also for messaging to and from applications, such as the ability to put the P in the right place in the, um, in the tracker board. It also uh, uses a technology um, which is promoted by the Health Level 7 Standards Organization, uh, which is called Smart on Fire, which uh, defines user interfaces that can be embedded in clinical workflows delivered by uh, electronic health records from uh, various vendors. It also uses uh, a something that's uh, kind of new to medicine. It uses a standards-based process management set of tools. These tools are very interesting because they've been applied in other industries for a number of years, but are just finding their way into medicine. They allow design of workflows and decision logic uh, using a standards-based authoring environment. Uh, and essentially what you end up with is, uh, is um, stateful workflows that can deliver the diagnostic evaluation and treatment components uh, of uh, application like e-pneumonia. Uh, basically, uh, can deliver those things and can make their design and creation much easier. Uh, this, by the way, is a standard developed by the Object Management Group, an international group that produces standards for a whole variety of industries and likes to develop generic standards for industries. And finally, this, uh, this latest uh, version of the application, which is currently under development, as I mentioned, uh, has got its clinical intelligence, that is the smarts that drives the process, delivered as a set of services. Uh, and these services uh, have become more and more complex as time has gone by. So they include, whoops, so they include 
uh, basically the services we're familiar with for interpreting x-rays or at least x-ray reports, the natural language processing services. But nowadays they also include a deep neural network that can extract the findings of pneumonia directly from the x-ray images. Uh, this is an application that we, we recently implemented uh, in our in association with our uh, PAX radiology system, and it appears to be working quite well. <coughs> uh, we also continue to do diagnosis with the Bayesian network uh, and uh, treatment planning with the antibiotic rules uh, and treatment severity evaluation using tools such as logistic regressions. Uh, so what you see is you see that in the environment we're developing, uh, essentially a whole variety of services can be made available to solve the kinds of problems that you see in directing workflows, like the workflow necessary to treat uh, pneumonia. I should digress for just a moment to talk about the object management groups, business process management languages. Again, I mentioned earlier that the object management group, which uh, is very much worth becoming familiar with, is another standards organization uh, with a much more general focus than the HL7 medical standards group. Uh, it basically focuses in uh, the standards necessary for a whole variety of industries uh, and in particular has some very nice standards for business process management uh, and graphical languages to describe those uh, business processes. Um, it, these languages have been designed so that they separate the processes, uh, the time, the part that goes on over time, from the decisions that direct the processes. A very interesting aspect of the work done by the object management group is they have a strong focus on graphical authoring tools uh, and the execution of uh, the uh, output of those tools. They've been promoting some of their standards uh, among the healthcare community in the last few years uh, as a part uh, through a group called the BPM for business process management, the BPM Plus Healthcare Community. And it's well worth looking on their website and becoming familiar with them uh, as they have a very interesting take on medical decision support through processes. Uh, they, these tools are also well designed to orchestrate sets of services meaning that uh, they make it very easy to call those services that you need uh, to help direct the workflow you're interested in. Uh, interesting side effect of, of, the stand, of the way the object management group develops standards is that the authoring tools while creating graphical outputs produce an executable output also which can be executed in special engines that allow you to move from a well-designed graphical uh, output to an executable application uh, quite straightforwardly. To give you a sense of what this looks like at the highest level, here is the, here is the workflow for the e-pneumonia application. Starting at the left, you see that uh, information comes in the form of a message that a patient has been registered in the ED. Uh, the boxes with pluses in them are design are subprocess. They're, they're designed to be exploded and to show you uh, a whole variety of uh, additional steps uh, when blown up. Uh, hey, hey and, Peter, I just uh, wanted to interject for a second and say maybe wrap up in about two minutes. I think I can do that. <laughs> okay, great. And so, and so as you follow this through, you see that uh, the process, again, this, at this high level, essentially involves assessing pneumonia, uh, mediating a physician review of the data, and then if the physician agrees, uh, the applications goes on to determine disposition, treatment, and then document and store uh, the results. 
Um, whoops, oh, wake up. There we go. So let's see, I may have just jumped over some. No. So basically, uh, in summary, I wanted to talk about two things. Uh, the first thing is that e pneumonia which I've spent most of my time talking about, has proven a great test bed for exploring a variety of technologies. It's a great test bed because it implements a complex process that goes on over time. Uh, it requires a variety of different components, uh, uh, best implemented as services. It uses artificial intelligence and machine learning resources. Uh, and um, in given recent uh, movement in the standards world, it can be uh, implemented as an interoperable application. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is it really should be embedded in a learning health system because the medical knowledge embedded in it is not static, it changes over time. And applications like this can be retrained as necessary as uh, the knowledge changes. The second summary is basically at a more general level. Um, there are new and evolving technologies, I've mentioned a bunch of them, that are now shaping the world of decision support. HL7's FIRE is giving us a chance to uh, develop applications outside of traditional EHRs that can be linked through the interoperability implied by these standards. Uh, these business process management standards allow us to create something new, in my experience, a decision support process rather than uh, just a alert or a static uh, type of decision support. Um, with artificial intelligence and machine learning, you can direct these new processes uh, as they travel uh, through time and oversee the diagnosis and treatment of a patient. And finally, some of the new computing environments that we're seeing are going to accelerate the dissemination of these novel approaches to healthcare computing. What I like to do is I like to create a horrible diagram at the end that will drive everybody nuts. On one side, I've got a hosting EHR replete with lots of different fire services, allowing it to communicate with outside applications. On the other side, I have a cloud environment that has a bunch of different engines in it, some of them from HL7, some of them from uh, the um, object management group, and all of them of use to rapidly develop and deploy uh, decision support processes. Um, and so uh, that basically is a direction that I think our world of clinical decision support is going to go. So that brings me to the end. I've only overshot, I think, by a few minutes, Wendy. I apologize. No, wonderful. Thanks so much. I'll let Brian close for us. Well, do we, um, first off, thank you, Peter. It was um, uh, in insightful and kind of uh, enjoyed the historical review as well as what the, the latest work is. Um, I don't see any specific questions, but I'll see if anyone uh, has a question. Oh, Daniel, you got your hand raised. I have a question. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Peter. This is uh, you know very, very inspiring. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, normally when we see interventions in healthcare that reduce mortality, you know, by 10%, 5%, you know, there's a lot of push to bring those to market in terms of drugs, devices, and a lot of money gets spent on these. Um, and, but, you know, there's companies pushing these behind the scenes, drug developers and, and device, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing companies. Uh, but in, in this space of clinical decision support systems, where we, over the years, and you demonstrated the evidence, we've been seeing over and over again that they can improve outcomes for patients. But it seems like only health informaticians are pushing for these things. Um, what are you, or what are your thoughts around how can we make the, you know, the patient community or the clinical community start pushing for these innovations to be widely adopted in healthcare? 
Well, so there are, are there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, <laughs> at least in the United States, uh, a number of government agencies have become moderately excited about these things and are pushing the technologies that are key to making uh, uh, applications like these available widely. Uh, and uh, those applications are um, the uh, U.S.'s ONC and the U.S.'s uh, CMS uh, groups, um, uh, Health Services Administration stuff, basically. Um, and uh, what they basically are doing is putting into regulations a requirement that the different vendors will adopt HL7 standards and make, therefore, their data available to outside applications. Because one of the great problems that application developers have had in terms of providing these applications uh, to various people is they have to be either redeveloped inside of each of the EHRs, inside of Epic and inside of Cerner and inside of Allscripts and Athena and so on and so forth. Either they have to be redeveloped there, or if you develop them externally in some sort of an application server like I showed, you have to tie them back to the EHR's data using proprietary services, proprietary data access services. Uh, and so you basically rewrite your data access and your um, user interface uh, gets uh, rewritten, at least in part, every time you go to a new vendor. And in many cases, these vendors don't have consistency across their different installations of their applications. So you can be rewriting significant parts of your application every time you install it in a new hospital. And in that environment, things are very expensive. Uh, your applications are not only expensive, but they become intractable when you want to modify and improve them. And as I mentioned, uh, medical knowledge has been moving on us in healthcare for a long time. It's moved a great deal during the time when we've uh, been building pneumonia applications, but it moves everywhere. There are new uh, tests, new drugs, uh, new understanding of old diseases, uh, and you have to be flexible enough so that you can respond to those uh, in a timely fashion, or you're basically practicing old medicine using a computer. Uh, and so it's a, it's a complicated world, uh, but uh, we're getting some help from government agencies right at the moment. And we are also getting some help from some companies. A variety of companies that have adopted, uh, that have, um, that have been building applications for the healthcare environment, uh, have adopted and are pushing very hard on the fire standards uh, in the hopes that it will make it much easier for their di them to distribute their applications. Uh, I'm beginning to work with a company right now, which is called Graphite. Um, which intends to uh, try to develop uh, a set of appliances that would live within a uh, healthcare uh, enterprises firewall and would prepare their data in such a way that it would be easily accessed in a standard way uh, from different applications. Uh, and the emergence of companies like that uh, and uh, essentially the uh, push on the um, big vendors by the federal government in the United States leads me to believe that uh, we're going to see some movement there. Okay, we got uh, Mark, uh, turn it over to you and then we'll wrap up. Not that there's that many people left. Okay, well, look, thanks very much, Peter. That was a wonderful uh, demonstration of evolution from really an alerts process right through to a you know, process reality. I guess my question goes back to where you began, and that is where physicians really couldn't find the written paper guidelines and didn't really want to interact with it potentially at all anyway. Um, mm -hmm. What have you found now with this current work? Uh, is there interaction with it? In other words, how do they perceive it? Do they use it? How do they interact with it? Is it a more positive proposition now than it was related to a written guidelines back 10, 20 years ago? 
Mm -hmm. Well, and so again, as you probably noticed, we have a bit of a moving target. We had uh, one application and then we changed EHRs and we had another application. Um, we're getting, we're getting uh, reasonable acceptance uh, of the application. One of the tricks is to try and get it to a point where it's right on its diagnosis frequently. We basically discovered that when our Bayesian network is not very accurate, the physicians really dislike the application because it uh, is another source of alert fatigue. It's driving them nuts. When the prompts are accurate, when it comes back uh, in an accurate way, it can actually streamline the work of up and treatment of a patient uh, because it leads you uh, straight through to the best set of choices in each case. Uh, and so it uh, costs them no additional time uh, usually to do the workup. And that, in fact, is the goal. The goal is basically to create a workflow that essentially reduces the sort of hunt and peck nature of using many of the current EHRs where the physician basically opens up one application to see the data, opens up another application to make an order, opens up another application to do its documentation, opens up another application to, uh, you know, essentially write a prescription. Uh, and uh, you can actually tie those all into one application and make it uh, basically a series of clicks to work through the process if you build the process correctly. Now, we haven't perfected that yet, but that is clearly the goal, essentially to get the diagnosis right and then to get the process right and to make the process streamlined so that it's more efficient than hunt and peck searching through the usual EHR user interface. All right, well, thanks, uh, Peter, and, you know, I would have, there was a post at the beginning about, I wonder what, you know, when you showed the picture of Homer and Al and Reed, you know, what they would think about our state now. Maybe I'll follow up with an email and I'll ask you to reflect philosophically about uh, if they time traveled or if they, you know, came, came back from the dead and visited our world now, you know, what their, what their view of things would be. Um, so next, our next seminar is in two weeks and we got another American kind of using up our Zoom uh, uh, conferencing um, while we're, there's still no travel, but we'll have Zach Kohani from uh, Harvard Medical School uh, speaking about unraveling complex diseases using um, phenome wide case studies and genomics. So uh, thanks again, Peter, and hope to see you at some point. Although I just My found pleasure. out that our, our fully vaccinated son in Salt Lake just got COVID. So um, <laughs> I don't know what this, uh, <clears throat> how long it'll be till we're traveling normally, but uh, thanks again and uh, uh, enjoy your fall uh, weather there in Salt Lake City. You have you folks have a great uh, you folks have a great let's see you guys are doing spring you have a great spring all right thanks Peter bye bye now.